Reverend Dr. Yazid Said to take over as the chair of the first plenary. Thank you. Thank you, Salman. It's good to chair this session. And um, I thought to just mention at the beginning that it's, it seems to me, from, from my uh, reflections on these things, is that, that there are two ways the public looks at the media. There's one expressed by the novelist Evelyn Waugh in his um, novel Scoop, where he says, news is what a chap who doesn't care about anything reads. Uh, and it's news on, only until he reads it. Uh, the other way of looking at the media is to ensure that it is there to check on our power and those who, who, do, who do exercise power over us. So a lot of this will be interesting as we look at the templates with which the media works in relationship to Islam. So without further ado, I'd like to ask our first speaker, Dr. Elizabeth Poole, is a, a senior lecturer in media. Uh, right, sorry, yeah. Um, I thought they would come one by one, but uh, please do come forward uh, if, uh, yeah. <coughs> Sorry, I, I just thought it might have been, uh, yeah, anyway, anyway. So Dr. Elizabeth Poole um, is a senior lecturer in media communications and culture at Keele University. She has written widely in the area of representation and reception of Muslims in the news and is author of Reporting Islam, Media Representations of British Muslims and editor with John Richardson of Muslims and the News Media, co-author with Professor Kim Knott and Dr. Timu Tyra of Media Portrayals of Religion and the Secular Sacred. So we look forward to what you have to share with us. And if I just mention that we are supposed to have 15 minutes for each speaker. Is it? I'm happy to sit here. Sit here. <laughs> you want a chair? <laughs> Okay. Um, hi everyone, my name's Elizabeth and um, thank you Salman for inviting me. I don't know where you've gone. Oh, there you are. <laughs> okay, so... Um, I got the tip about that because I asked Oh, so you said... Thanks. Okay, so I'm just going to say a bit about why I'm here today before I talk about... Um, the media representation of Muslims and I've been working in this area for about 20 years now. I've done three studies. The first one was on um, four British newspapers looking at uh, coverage between 1994 to 1997. The second book was based, it's an edited collection but my work in there was based on coverage in newspapers post 2001 and after the war in Iraq. And the last one was based on a comparative study of newspapers and television between 2008 and 9, but also looking back at how that compares with um, the 1980s. I also have done a little bit of work on media production about Muslims and audience reception as well. Um, but I'm just going to be talking about media representation today. And I'm going to be responding to uh, Salman's findings and the extracts that he sent us. Um, mainly reinforcing and building on what he said because I'm actually in agreement with what, you, what you're saying. So, so the first thing I just want to do as a media lecturer is just talk about how I'm coming at this from a kind of media academic perspective. So we always say the most important thing to do is to look at context when we're talking about the media, to understand what it's about. So whether that's to do with how the media operates in a commercial system and how that leads to mainly conservative output, or whether that's to do with looking at the global economic crash, for example, and how that's hardened attitudes towards minority groups, because 
um, immigrants are framed as kind of a drain on resources. So it's kind of the politics of austerity that is resulting in this kind of more negative representation that we're seeing now, as well as the kind of global movement of people across the world. Um, another point that I always want to make is how the media is quite plural. So we shouldn't overgeneralise about the media. You know, there's a lot of differentiation in the media across countries, within countries. So we don't want to make the mistake of homogenising as we say the media homogenises Muslims. Um, and also, rep representation, how should we understand this? Well, representation takes place in a social context. It's a construction. Um, it's not about... Um, so it, it doesn't say some, tell us anything about Muslims. The signifier Muslim is a construction, and it tells us something about who's doing the representing and, who, and the context in which that representation takes place. So it's not about reflecting some kind of objective reality out there. N the new selection process is also important. It informs us about how certain things become news. So obviously this story didn't become news because it was the most imp important story of the day. You know, it reflects certain ideologies, it reflects agendas, it reflects news production processes, news gathering techniques, it reflects ideological values. So it's an, again, it's not just a straightforward reflection of what's happening in the world, it's a construction. <laughs> and news reports, if we're thinking about how to understand text, we have to think about how they're structured in dominance. They're structured with a preferred reading, using certain headlines, using certain images, using certain captions. And this frames the story for us and leads to a preferred meaning, how we should understand the story. But, of course, texts are always polysemic and they're always open to interpretations by different types of people. Okay, so I'm responding to the extracts that Salman sent us. The first one being the story about segregation in universities, sex segregation in, in the Islamic society of a university. Um, and this follows um, a lot of research that I've done around certain topics that shows the most prominent topics that are occurring in the media about Muslims, which I know probably a lot of people will be familiar with, but to build on this... And I've found that this has been a common topic in terms of the coverage of Muslims over the last 20 years. And it's included coverage of things like separate RE lessons, the funding of Muslim schools, and more recently this Operation Trojan Horse case, which was framed as extremism. So we can see education has become a battleground over the cultural um, evolution of the nation. And in these articles, British identity is at stake. So in, by implication, by framing these articles in terms of what uh, British identity is and through this idea of British values, Muslims are excluded from this. <coughs> these tend to be fairly hypocritical in what they're saying because they only focus on Muslim faith schools and no other types of faith schools. And they imply that um, Muslims are self-segregationist. The link to extremism was taken to another level in the Operation Trojan Horse case. So what you got was a conflation of conservative um, Islamic practices with extremism, which was defined as radicalization. So schools where parental involvement had been encouraged to improve pupil performance were defined as too Muslim and therefore extremist and therefore radicalizing. So there was this conflation taking place, which happens in these sorts of stories. But it's important to say that there isn't a consensus, that sometimes these stories are pushed onto the agenda by Muslim groups themselves, and um, therefore there's various conceptualizations of identity within these stories. Another article that um, Salman sent us was the article on conversion, which showed 100,000 British women had, had converted to Islam. And Salman said this was quite surprising, as most... Um, articles focus on young um, white men that have converted to Islam and then committed terror attacks like this article on Nick Riley. Um, but there is a history of the press focusing on white women who have married Muslims and converted to Islam, like this story um, about Sarah Cook who married, married a Turkish waiter in 1997. And there's always a sense 
Um, obviously, there's a focus on cultural difference in these articles, but there's always a sense of some kind of deficiency with the converts. So, for example, Mick Riley had Asperger's. Um, it was suggested Sarah Cook was bullied. Um, and there's always a sense that they're not fully convinced uh, con con um, Muslims, and they're going to convert back as soon as they kind of see sense. But um, obviously, there's certain discourses here to do with Islamification, to do with the cultural threat, to do with Islam as an expansionary force. And there's also a gendered discourse, women as weak, as victims, subject to predatory behaviour, whether that's uh, criminal behaviour or sexual behaviour. Also, as carriers of culture, women is important as carriers of culture, so it's important for the future culture of the, of the nation. And also, of course, the repression of women. And the veil is the ultimate kind of signifier of the kind of threat, cultural and security threat. So we get in these stories either kind of ideas of Muslims as either aggressor or victim. Okay, Salman also centers, um, he showed how popular culture also can be extremely stereotypical in the representation in spooks of um, British terrorism. And of course, dramas can oversimplify because they need these kind of stock villains that are recognisable. In, I haven't actually examined popular culture. Peter Moray and Amina uh, Yaquin did a, uh, wrote an interesting book called Framing Muslims that looked at popular culture. But I, ha I can talk about how terrorism has been represented in the news. And I've noticed four common elements in terms of categorisation. So there's a slippage between certain categories that are used, such as militants, extremists, fanatics and terrorism. So when each of these categories are used, they're infused with ideas of terrorism, so extremism becomes conflated with terrorism. Also, agency, across the news, Muslims are often aggressors, um, they're active in terms of a negative sense, while as obviously non-Muslims tend to be in these stories kind of agents of positive behaviour like the police being heroes and that kind of thing. There's also a decontextualization, so a lack of history, a lack of politics uh, linked to any kind of explanation of what's going on. So Islamic belief tends to become the rationale and the explanation for behavior. There's also a process of othering. So for example, if, we, if, if the press are trying to explain why UK citizens are bombing other UK citizens, the actors are othered by linking them to radicals from outside the UK. Uh, and it's all usually suggested that this has gone on through kind of technology, which obviously is a very kind of simplification of the radicalization process as a kind of linear process. But this allows um, this allows them to protect themselves from accusations of, of racism by othering uh, by an othering discourse. Okay, so Salman also okay. Uh, talked about broadcast media and how um, it's less stereotypical and ideological than print media uh, by examining this um, documentary, The Untold Story. And I've also looked at broadcast media and found similarly that it tends to be more nuanced because it tends to come out of religious cultural programming. But however, it still relies on certain stereotypes about Islam. So for example, this BBC Two programme, Around the World in 80 Faiths, focused on exoticism and weird practices. And Islam and the, uh, Iran and the West, for example, um, relies on this idea that Iran is only uh, important or significant um, with its relations with the West. So it's still relying on kind of oriental stereotypes about Muslims um, in its representation. OK, so my last slide, just to, to reinforce some of these issues, um, obviously, the representation of Islam uh, generally across the press um, relies on reproducing established discourses of Muslims as, as a cultural and security threat. And because of this threat, there's this kind of retreat to British identity, British values, which is constructed in a, in a particular way because of these uncertainties of living in a globalised world. <coughs> However, I do want to emphasise that audiences are not cultural dupes. 
they do interpret things in different ways. But when there is a limited um, availability of information about Islam in the public sphere, and that's the only sort of publicly available information, it does limit people's ideas about Islam. But we should also note that there are Muslim vo- more Muslim voices in the news media now. Some news media is listening. Channel 4, for example, The Guardian. There's more and more Muslim voices. So that's a positive development that perhaps we can work on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That was perfect timing. Um, so our, without further ado, our second speaker, is Chris Johnson, is a journalist and communicator who has worked in local and national newspaper <coughs> Papers, broadcasting, PR, and online news in a career spanning four decades. He is a UK, um, uh, originally based out of uh, UK local TV pioneer, having established Bay TV Liverpool as internet TV station in 2011, originally based out of the press agency that he then operated. Uh, there's a lot I could say about him, but uh, uh, in order not to lose more time, I'm going to ask him to come and share his thoughts with us. Uh, I can't get on the internet, so I'm afraid I'm not quite um, as uh, technically proficient as uh, a good doctor here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Um, yes, my name is Chris Johnson. I'm, I'm station manager at Made in Liverpool, the local TV station. Uh, in the city, and that first started broadcasting in December 2014. So it's a local TV station that broadcasts on Freeview, Sky, and Virgin to something like uh, a million homes in the greater Merseyside area, for those of you who are not from this region. Uh, and so just to expand on my positive biography, um, I've spent a lifetime working in the media, including a long stint writing for national newspapers, for some of the ones that uh, you've just seen excerpts from. More recently, I've had hands-on experience in working in online publishing, broadcasting and PR. I'm chair of the local TV network, the trade body of local TV, and also I chair the Liverpool-based charity, charity, the James Bulger Memorial Trust. And um, I am a practising Roman Catholic. Uh, Let me start then by offering a note of thanks to uh, Dr Al-Azam and the Hope University for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, as I've outlined, my experience is largely as a jobbing news hack, and uh, I cannot deny that this body of experience largely informs my appraisal of Salam's book. Uh, I should add in passing that I would like to distance myself from some of the greater excesses and outrageous practices adopted by elements of what we used to call Fleet Street. Uh, More lately, I find myself dismayed and appalled at the lack of integrity that has become the hallmark of online news websites as they indulge in cutthroat competition for eyeballs. Uh, Many are now simply sausage machines churning out tawdry content that deserves nothing less than the withering epithet by which it is now known, namely clickbait. But let me add that this phenomenon is not limited to national newspapers. It also pervades re- uh, relative newcomers uh, like the Huffington Post or niche sites like Female First and indeed the online sites of more august newspapers like The Guardian. Uh, with the online versions in, uh, also of local weekly newspapers and indeed including the Liverpool Echo, who I'm surprised to see are not represented here today. I don't know whether they were invited. Um, This mania for clickbait is a uh, a disturbing trend and indeed it updates uh, some of the publications that we've seen uh, highlighted here and indeed that are uh, included in Salman's um, examples that have been sent to us today as speakers. Uh, Because um, this um, instant news is news without thought and often without very much research and in very little context. Uh, So um, the only hope that I can really draw from that, as we are asked later uh, to to look for some positive elements and and perhaps uh, addressing uh, these uh, uh, influences in society and the media, 
is to say that perhaps this, uh, the reality of the media today can be harnessed um, towards um, the declared aim of combating ne negative stereotyping, uh, which is frequently directed towards persons of faith and those who practice Islam in particular. I'll just quote to you uh, an ex extract from Salman's book. On page 40 he says, The Arab-Israeli conflict is central to the politics of Europe and the USA, and often the tension between Muslims and Jews in the Middle East transcends geographical boundaries, with intermittent wars in Gaza, Gaza being uh, seen as playing a divisive factor amongst politicians, communities and the media. On the other hand, he says, although Christianity as a faith does not create media headlines for the wrong reasons, and in many situations, its role in, um, it plays a positive role in interfaith dialogues. The very fact that the largest religion in Western societies is Christianity, the very fact that the largest religion in Western society is Christianity, but Islam still grabs the media headlines, affects how some Christians perceive Muslims. Another reason for enhanced media attention on religions in recent times is the challenge Western secular societies face due to increased relig religiosity amongst Muslims and Jews. Contro controversies related to halal and kosher methods of slaughter, wearing the hijab, and gender segregation issues amongst Muslims, and to some extent Jews, have brought religion to the forefront of media discourse. I would not take issue with Salman on this point. However, I would suggest that we must recognise that Muslims are far from being the only target for vilification of religion uh, from a media that reflects the prejudice and views of its readers. In 2014, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, declared... Britain is now post-Christian, a post-Christian country after research had suggested that the majority of Anglicans and Roman Catholics now feel afraid to express their beliefs. Interviewed by The Telegraph, Lord Williams said, Britain is no longer a nation of believers and that a further decline in, in the sway of the church is likely in the years ahead. I would like to suggest that this group, to this group, that all the major faiths, Christians, Jews, Hindus and Muslims, are now misunderstood, sometimes deliberately so, and depicted as otherly, frankly a bit odd, if not downright potty, by the media, who are again reflecting the perceived prejudices and opinions held by the majority of their readers, readers and audience members. We also live in a society where the rights of the individual are held to be sacrosanct and paramount, something that is inimical to the teachings uh, of the principles of the main religions. The word Muslim, for example, translates as one who submits, one who surrenders. This is contrary to the self-image of the majority of the secular UK population, many of whom are members of the so-called Me First Society. This excessive individual, individualism also feeds prejudice and bigotry against anyone who proclaims themselves to be members of organised religions, whose members believe in fasting, abstinence, or per in periods like Ramadan or Lent. So, how does all this key into the question that we are here to examine? Thus far, you will note that I have not mentioned knives, bullets, bombs, or even hooks. I have deliberately refrained from doing so. I believe that the reaction to the daily barbaric killings in the Middle East war zones and the horrendous terrorist attacks in the UK and elsewhere are the very obvious tip of a much bigger iceberg. They are uh, subject to banner head headlines, Twitter storms, Facebook frenzies and hypershock bulletins on TV and radio. How can we combat this kind of negative publicity? In my opinion, the honest answer in the short term is that it will run its course and that there is little that can be done through, the influence, of, uh, through influence or legislation to eradicate or significantly impact on this kind of reporting. The journalists writing these stories are motivated by competition and commercial elements. Very often some of the stories that, um, that you just saw um, displayed on the screen are almost not really 
written for the, for, the, uh, for the audience. They're written as a competition for who's got the best front page on the, on the, on the newsstand. It's journalists competing against each other for the most eye-kicking, uh, eye-catching and outrageous stories that they can find. And the journalists and the, the sub-editors and the editor go home, go home thinking, we won. And that's what is a big motivation for a lot of what happens in online and indeed in broadcast media. You know, I won't deny that there is also you know, very great competition in broadcasting as well. So how can we combat this kind of, of negative publicity? My belief is that the only means of, of breaking down these walls of prejudice and bigotry is with the truth. Bad news sells. It's like the ebb and flow of a tide, and it is an unstoppable force that will not be turned around. All we can aim to do is to set about promoting the truth. And the ordinary and extraordinary achievements of people of faith and the triumphs uh, of organised religion. Like water dripping on a stone, witnessing to the truth and promoting news items social, in social media campaigns and uh, in broadcasts that depict people of faith as normal is, I believe, the only means we have of overwriting the sensationalist and negative publicity. The sad thing is that the Christian faiths actually, in my opinion, and I speak as a, as a Roman Catholic, I do myself a very poor job of proclaiming the gospel through the media. I suspect the same can be said of the Quran. Rather than being on the back foot all the time, the mainstream religions have a duty to take an initiative, not to hold back, but to be high profile and visible when Britain indeed any country, is being tested by a terrorist outrage or a natural catastrophe, like the disaster at Grenfell Tower. These are the times when the church and their leaders, churches and their leaders, should be conspicuous and vocal in their condemnation of the latest atrocity. I was reading here on the way here, I, I did a little check on Google, and for the London Bridge um, outrage, 130 imams sent out a tweet de uh, decrying the London Bridge um, outrage. And I mean, I'm sorry, but that's just not enough. You know, a tweet from 130 imams just is not enough. Uh, that was reported in, in the Independent. It, w it probably wasn't characterised. The language that was used was far too overblown to, to command the headline in the Sun or the or the Mirror or the Star. Now, if you know, this is really a public a, a public relations battle and a battle for the for the hearts and minds of the, of society, of the public at large, and it won't be done except through through a real um, a really tough campaign to to win those hearts and minds and to change attitudes and perspectives. Trying to overturn, trying to persuade journalists not to do what they're doing, is is impossible. It, they will not be turned back from what they are doing. All we can try to do is to deflect them and to try and overwrite the negative publicity with positive publicity. So I would say that only by bonding together in a common cause can Muslims, Christians and people of other faiths hope to successfully put the argument that they are a force for good and that they too have rights, albeit not always me first rights. Thank you. Thank you. That was also very much on time. Thank you so much for keeping the time so far. And it was good to hear Rowan Williams quoted. Uh, so we go to the third, our third speaker, and that's Mr. Talha Ahmed, who is a solicitor by profession specializing in dispute resolution and regulatory matters. He is the youngest treasurer of, at the Muslim Council of Britain the most diverse, inclusive, and representative Muslim umbrella organization. He is also co-chair of Stand Up to Racism, a national anti-racism, anti-fascism, and anti-Islamophobia campaign body. He is a very experienced commentator, regularly appearing on the national and international print and broadcast media com commenting on Muslim affairs. 
He's also recognized as an expert commentator on the Bangladesh of Bangladeshi affairs. Uh, so, Talha, please come and. Uh, it is great to be here uh, among you, especially to uh, share uh, our thought on an issue that probably uh, takes much of MCV's resource, more so than any other uh, issue. Uh, I just want to add uh, some of the issues that has come, um, uh, Trojan horse segregation. I also happen to be the solicitor acting for some of those that found themselves at the midst of Trojan horse. I think that's a good point to start. The reason I brought that is because you are familiar of the allegations on those segregation, conservative practices, and so forth. And yet, as a lawyer going through over 80 volumes of documents, much of which not in public domain, looking at evidence that government was um, planning to use in some of these allegations, I can happily say to you that none of the so-called perpetrators of Trojan horse were tried for segregation. They were not tried for extremism. They were not even tried for conservative religious practices because by admission, there was no systematic segregation in any of those schools as um, you know, evidenced by the very own Peter Clark report. There weren't any evidence of systematic imposition of Islam within the state school. And just to give you one example, I will link that to um, our uh, today's discussion, just by way of an example. So the excessive imposition of Islamic practices in the words of one very senior school leader who gave evidence in one of the trials amounted to too much Arabic. Under scrutiny, that too much Arabic happened to be used of assalamu alaikum, of which she did not know the meaning of. So when she was asked as an agnostic, would you say to me, if you see me on the street, uh, find me sneezing, would you say to me, uh, bless you? And she said, yes. Would you accept that it has very Christian root? Yes. So why as an agnostic would you say, bless you, when uh, you clearly uh, do not subscribe to the faith? It's part of our culture, become integral uh, part of how we greet people in certain circumstances. So you accept that there's nothing wrong in Muslims wanting to say assalamu alaikum to another Muslim, be it in a school setting. No. Of course, there wasn't a huge coverage when that decision came out two days before the general election. The judge obviously timed it very well. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, the judge who happened to be also Muslim and deprived me two Friday prayers by reducing the uh, lunch breaks on Friday because he was keen to finish the job on time, also decided conveniently that there's no need to make any finding on whether my client undermined fundamental British values through his conduct, because that was unneeded, because there was enough nitty gritties in terms of financial breaches and others, whereby they could uphold the ban on him. So the whole idea of Trojan Horse suddenly went. Press Association, um, has a base uh, about 20 years from where we had this hearing. They were aware of it. Every media were aware of it. After first day, when the government's opening line was that this trial is not about conspiracy, uh, it's not about terrorism, it's not about radicalism, it's not about segregation, it's not about imposing Islam. Unfortunately, I did not see them after that, and obviously you did not see that re you know, verdict reported. How does that so then relate to where we are? Um, let me just say that the work of uh, Dr. Salman is very welcome and is um, very useful. It collates. There's been many work done, probably not as much as it should have been, but there are significant amount of work done about coverage of Muslims in the media. But he brings a lot of it together. Um, so I'm very much in agreement with much of it, but there are aspects that I think it could have gone further. 